public safety contracts the last time around, and specifically the amount of vacation and sick and personal time that we routinely approve. The chiefs, of course, having now reached the pinnacle of their respective departments, should not be, and I don't expect them, to take a reduction in terms of that aspect of the total compensation package. Um, but the problem, we, we say from time to time that we're cognizant of it, Leon does say it every time during the budget, that your personnel costs are two-thirds almost of your budget. And I've asked in the past if somebody could explain to me why we end up negotiating for such, I would say, unrealistic amounts of vacation and sick and personal time in our collective bargaining agreements. That question has really never been answered, but the bottom line of it is that a, under the current contracts, a person uh, in either department, basically, who is at the top of the uh, pay scale, short of being a chief, would have something between 25 and 30 percent of the total annual work days available to them through vacation or sick or personal time. We actually, the, the contract that's being proposed for the fire chief is, is an improvement over the last chief's contract where the number was 30 percent. It was 77, out of a prospective 260 day work year, fully 77 days could have been taken each year under that contract for these categories of vacation and sick. Um, nothing's going to change unless we, we start the change if there's really a willingness to make that kind of a change. I don't know if there is, but when we negotiate the contracts, we're negotiating now with police, we'll be negotiating with fire. You know, as long as we forget the salaries and forget the steps in the contracts, for that one piece of it, the, the additional time and the time off that people are entitled to, and much of which can be carried forward. There are some caps now, but realistically, you know, the caps don't necessarily help you because they almost compel a person then to use all their time each year if they're not in a position to carry any more additional time. So we end up with even the best negotiated contracts now for chiefs are basically driven by the contracts that preceded them the, in, in each of the departments and the benefit levels that we routinely give there. So. I've always thought that, you know, lacking some explanation, those, those numbers are just too high. And you know, for 25 to 30 percent of a person's work year to be basically time off, if they want it to be, that I've never heard explained in any kind of reasonable way. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to vote no, because that wouldn't be fair to either the chiefs, but, you know, I also can't vote yes, so I abstain. <coughs> Sarah? As I look at these contracts, you know, a lot of times people get upset about union contracts. And there's a lot of people who want instant change. They want things to just magically change and go the way they want. What I look at with this is it puts us in a better position. Our chiefs worked with us to do this. You look at raises are no longer tied to what the bargaining units get. All the money that's negotiated for is now inside. You don't have longevity, education, and clothing allowances outside that sum of money. It provides better transparency and puts the city in a better position for where we go next. I think that the contracts that were negotiated put Brigantine in a good position to continue to move forward. And I'll tell you, both of our chiefs do an outstanding job. I'm proud of what they do. And I think this is fair compensation for the job that they do. So I say yes. They're not going to cheat the city out of anything, as uh, we were talking about. Um, compensation if they were sick or they feel they need to burn days or whatever the case may be. Um, um, they, have, they have given up longevity in this contract. Longevity is now part of their total compensation so it will not sit outside but it, it's, it's no longer a side piece to the contract. They've given up their education benefit, they've given up uh, their clothing allowance, so those things are, are now part of a total compensation package and they will be in the, in the contract um, and it is much more transparent that way. And the issue with public employees and, um, and sick time, they, uh, 
you, you get into a situation where this debate goes on. The employees who show up every day and haven't burned their sick time, and, and there's an assumption sometimes that is made that if you give someone 12 sick days a year, they're going to use 12 sick days a year um, that they have been employees. So I think this is um, a good contract. I think it's a fair contract for the city of Brigantine. It's transparent. This is the total compensation that our police and fire chiefs uh, will receive. And um, I'm happy uh, to vote on this because it is securing the employment um, because the contract goes both ways. Uh, there, there are some, some penalties if they leave early. Um, we actually are able to um, know that we have the quality individuals uh, that we have serving in these positions will be here uh, for the term of this contract. And, and quite frankly, I hope they stay longer. Ed, let me, if I could, ask you a couple questions about the golf course, because you and I have you provided me with the information that I requested from time to time about the uh, revenues and the costs of the golf course. The last information that we had was that the end through 2016, we, we were showing round figures, $794,000 in total receipts, and including an assessment for water and sewer, uh, 785 in costs. The cost number, though, didn't have any entry for either pension contribution or unemployment, even though we had budgeted for both of those items at the start of the year. 
did we not incur any pension or unemployment cost related to the golf course? The way we've structured it, if the golf course can't pay for itself, we pick up the difference. The golf course has always been presented as when it was first taken over by the city and ever since. Uniformly presented as and structured as utility specifically because it was claimed that it would be self-sufficient, self-sustaining, which sadly it's not. The, the numbers from 2015 to 2016 show that total revenues dropped from about 981 to 794. That's pretty steep. Thank God that the ACIA was able to do the job they were and reduce our costs. But we all know that you reach a point when you're not going to be able to reduce costs anymore. I look at this Band-Aid measure of changing the policy as being nothing more than a Band-Aid. Uh, and next year when, you know, I hope like everybody up here hopes that golf course has a banner year. But I'm also not going to put my head in the sand and say that these numbers don't mean anything. My God, you dropped almost 200,000 in revenues in one year. So next year, when we're looking at it again, then we'll be making other adjustments. And we'll say, well, let's take out the uh, food, well, golf, golf cart leases, maybe. We'll take that out. And the city will pay that directly to save money. It's, it's all for appearances sake. We're not addressing the fundamental issue, which is golf course as a golf course run by us is very close to being a money losing proposition. And that's without even talking about debt service. This is just basic profit and loss year to year. So uh, I, don't, I don't see the point other than for appearances sake of changing the policy, so I vote no. Sarah Simpson. Yeah, being a businessman, it, it doesn't make sense charging yourself for something that's a necessity. It's not very much water that they want to put on there. They want to put it on the greens and, and, uh, and the tea boxes. I came up here with the intention of having one item, but I'm going to add one to that. And it is, it concerns what you just did, what you just approved with the policy concerning water usage at the golf course. That approval is a complete contradiction of the premise upon which this course was sold to the Brigantine taxpayers at the time of purchase, which was it was to be self-sustaining. And the cost of it was not to be borne by the taxpayers. Well, for the past several years, part of it has been borne by the taxpayers, and now evidently another item will be added to that cost. People who don't play golf, just live here as taxpayers are going to assume a greater cost for the golf course and I think that's um, rather dishonest on the part of this this council if you said something that we're having financial problems and we have to um, place a burden on you rather than on the people who use it then um, you're not doing that. You're simply doing this now, and the public will not be aware of it. And I, I think that uh, goes back on what you promised to the public several years ago at the time of purchase. 